Good evening and welcome back to another episode of The Longing, where today we are going to be continuing to read The Time Machine, and I think we may either be able to finish it today or get very close. I think it's going to be close. <laughs> so, let's get going. Chapter 12 So I came back... Wait. Chapter 12 so I came back. For a long time I must have been insensible upon the machine. The blinking succession of the days and nights was resumed. The sun got golden again. The sky blue. I breathed with greater freedom. The fluctuating contours of the land ebbed and flowed. The hands spun backward upon the dials. At last I saw again the dim shadows of houses, the evidences of decadent humanity. These two changed and passed, and others came. Presently, when the million dial was at zero, I slackened speed. I began to recognize our own petty and familiar architecture. The thousands hand ran back to the starting point. The night and day flapped slower and slower. Then the old walls of the laboratory came around me. Very gently, now, I slowed the mechanism down. I saw one little thing that seemed odd to me. I think I have told you that when I set out, before my velocity became very high, Mrs. Watchett had walked across the room, travelling, as it seemed to me, like a rocket. As I returned, I passed again across that minute when she traversed the laboratory. But now her every motion appeared to be the exact inversion of her previous ones. The door at the lower end opened, and she glided quietly up the laboratory back foremost, and disappeared behind the door by which she had previously entered. Just before that I seemed to see Hillier for a moment, but he passed like a flash. Then I stopped the machine, and saw about me again the old familiar laboratory. My tools, my appliances just as I had left them. I got off the thing very shakily, and sat down upon my bench. For several minutes I trembled violently. Then I became calmer. About, around me was my old workshop again, exactly as it had been. I might have slept there, and the whole thing have been a dream. And yet, not exactly. The thing had started from the southeast corner of the laboratory. It had come to rest again in the northwest, against the wall where you saw it. That gives you the exact distance from my little lawn to the pedestal of the White Sphinx into which the Morlocks had carried my machine. For a time my brain went stagnant. Presently I got up and came through the passage here, limping because my heel was still painful, and feeling sorely begrimed. I saw the Paul Mole Gazette on the table by the door. I found the date was indeed today, and looking at the timepiece, saw the hour was almost eight o'clock. I heard your voices and the clatter of plates. I hesitated. I felt so sick and weak. Then I sniffed the good wholesome meat and opened the door on you. You know the rest. I washed and dined and now I am telling you the story. I know, he said after a pause, that all this will be absolutely incredible to you. To me the one incredible thing is that I am here tonight in this old familiar room looking into your friendly faces and telling you these strange adventures. He looked at the medical man. No, I cannot expect you to believe it. Take it as a lie, or a prophecy. Say I dreamed it in the workshop. Consider I have been speculating upon the destinies of our race until I have hatched this fiction. Treat my assertion, sorry, my assertion of its truth as a mere stroke of art to enhance its interest, and taking it as a story. What do you think of it? He took up his pipe and began, in his old accustomed manner, to tap with it nervously upon the bars of the grate. There was a momentary stillness. Then chairs began to creak and shoes to scrape upon the carpet. I took my eyes off the time traveller's face and looked round at his audience. They were in the dark and little spots of colour swam before them. The medical man seemed absorbed in, con in the contemplation of our host. 
The editor was looking hard at the end of his cigar. The sixth. The journalist fumbled for his watch. The others, as far as I remember, were motionless. The editor stood up with a sigh. What a pity it is you're not a writer of stories, he said, putting his hand on the time traveller's shoulder. You don't believe it? Well, I thought not. The time traveller turned to us. Where are the matches, he said. He lit one and sp spoke over his pipe, puffing. To tell you the truth, I hardly believe it myself. And yet, his eye fell with a mute inquiry upon the withered white flowers upon the little table. Then he turned over the hand holding his pipe, and I saw he was looking at some half-heeled scars on his knuckles. The medical man rose, came to the lamp, and examined the flowers. The gyne... Ganesium's odd, he said. I don't know if that's the right pronunciation. The psychologist leant forward to see, holding out his hand for a specimen. I'm hanged if it isn't a quarter to one, said the journalist. How shall we get home? Plenty of cabs at the station, said the psychologist. It's a curious thing, said the medical man, but I cer certainly don't know the natural order of these flowers. May I have them? The time traveller hesitated. Then suddenly, certainly not. Where did you really get them? said the medical man. The time traveller put his hand to his head. He spoke like one who was trying to keep hold of an idea that eluded him. They were put into my pocket by Wiener when I travelled into time. He stared around the room. I'm damned if it isn't all going. This room and you and the atmosphere of every day is too much for my memory. Did I ever make a time machine, or a model of a time machine? Or is it all only a dream? They say life is a dream, a precious poor dream at times, but I can't stand another that won't fit. It's madness. And where did the dream come from? I must look at that machine, if there is one. He caught up the lamp swiftly and carried it, flaring red, through the door into the corridor. We followed him. There in the flickering light of the lamp was the machine, sure enough, squat, ugly, and askew, a thing of brass, ebony, ivory, and translucent glimmering quartz, solid to the touch, for I put out my hand and felt the rail of it, and with brown spots and smears upon the ivory, and bits of grass and moss upon the lower parts and one rail bent awry. The time traveller put the lamp down on the bench and ran his hand along the damaged rail. It's all right now, he said. The story I told you was true. I'm sorry to have brought you out here in the cold. He took up the lamp, and, in absolute silence, we returned to the smoking room. He came into the hall with us and helped the editor on with his coat. The medical man looked into his face and, with a certain hesitation, told him he was suffering from overwork, at which he laughed hugely. I remember him standing in the open doorway, bawling good night. I shared a cab with the editor. He thought the tale a gaudy lie. For my own part, I was unable to come to a conclusion. The story was so fantastic and incredible, the telling so credible and sober, I lay awake most of the night thinking about it. I determined to go next day and see the time traveller again. I was told he was in the laboratory and, and being on easy terms in the house, I went up to him. The laboratory, however, was empty. I stared for a minute at the time machine and put out my hand and touched the lever. At that the squat substantial looking mass swayed like a bow shaken by the wind. Its instability startled me extremely, and I had a queer reminiscence of the childish days when I used to be forbidden to meddle. I came back through the corridor. The time traveller met me in the smoking room. He was coming from the house. He had a small camera under one arm and a knapsack under the other. He laughed when he saw me and gave me an elbow to shake. I'm frightfully busy, said he, with that thing in there. And with that, we come to the end of the episode, because we're not going to get the next five pages read in time. So, we're going to leave that for tomorrow. So, for now, 
thank you very much for joining me today. I hope you all have a wonderful morning, evening, afternoon or night. No matter what time of day it is, I hope you all have a wonderful one of it. And as always, we will be back tomorrow for more of The Longing. Goodbye.